Welcome, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's a treat to see so many people here tonight, old friends, new friends, students. It's wonderful to see you. We're all here for the 10th annual Morton Marcus Poetry Reading. My goodness, a decade, that seems impossible, of tremendous poetry and extraordinary poets. Hooray for Morton and hooray for us. Before we go any further, if you haven't already done so, this is a great time to turn off your phones, your computers, anything that'll go buzz or blink. And um, we ask that there be no photography during the reading, please. My name is Gary Young, and it is my very, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's a sure A right there. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight as a member of the creative writing faculty here at UCSC. I'm thrilled that tonight's reading is an ongoing part of our Living Writers series and that we have the opportunity to gather in this magnificent auditorium. I love this. Um, this event would not be possible without the efforts of many individuals and the generous support of several institutions. I'd like to thank our sponsors the Owl Family Properties from UCSC. Yeah, yeah. From UCSC, the Humanities Institute, Special Collections and Archives, the Living Writers Series, the Porter Hitchcock Poetry Fund, Cowell College, Poetry Santa Cruz, and the Cultural Council of Santa Cruz County, Cabrillo College English Department, and Santa Cruz Writes. Yeah, give them all a hand. And I'd also like to salute my colleagues and good friends on the Morton Marcus Poetry Reading Organizing Committee. A lot of work goes on behind, uh, behind the, the scene here. So for 10 years, I'm still having trouble getting used to that 10 year thing. Um, the Morton Marcus Poetry Reading has honored Morton Marcus, our dear friend, and one of the country's premier poets. For those of you too young to have had the opportunity to meet Morton personally, I can tell you that he was an honest to God, larger than life character, much beloved, and was unquestionably the father of the poetry scene here in Santa Cruz County. Mort was also a novelist, a memoirist, a film and literary critic, and he left an enormous mark on our local community. Mort taught at Cabrillo College for 30 years, and if you're involved in writing groups or local poetry readings, slams, open mics, and other literary eruptions in our town, they all have their origins in the readings that Morton established here in the 1970s. He was our community's original poetry champion. In addition to his writing and his teaching and his community organizing, Mort hosted the poetry show on our local community radio station and a popular television program as well. Mort received a Gail Rich Award and was honored as a Santa Cruz County Artist of the Year. Morton's archive is now held in the Special Collections Library here at UC Santa Cruz, and I encourage you to take advantage of the riches there, including, if I'm not mistaken, recordings of our readings. Now, every year, I have the pleasure of reading a few of Morton's poems to get us started, and it is something I look forward to all year long. Roaming through Mort's books in my library this past week, it occurred to me that I had somehow neglected a couple of Mort's earlier works in my past selections. So tonight I'm going to start with a short poem, How Would You Touch the Body of God, from his book Big Wings, Glass Mornings, Shadows Cast by Stars, and then read Summer from The Armies Encamped in the Fields Beyond the Unfinished Avenues. And I'll end with Blinking, a poem from Moments Without Names. How would you touch the body of God? How would you touch the body of God? By clamping your palm on his contours like a roller coaster hurtling down its tracks, or like a blind man, by skimming your fingertips along the base of a mountain range? I, for one, 
think that his body is the edge of the universe and would finger it accordingly like a tailor testing a fabric. Oh yes, we know the likelihood of finding him is rare, but we keep in practice anyway. That is why we touch each other's lives as often as we can, leaving our words and fingerprints on each other's breath, and why, when we remove our hands, our thumbs are radiant, gorged with static, and our index fingers waver like wands. Summer. Dawn arrives and we nod. It is always the same. We have no one to accuse and continue to plant. At noon, we listen to the scratching of beetles as the heat scrapes against distant escarpments. The odor of crops enslaves us to vegetables, well-being, serenity, a rustling growth for we could not maintain a leaf in the city and had come here full of renewed confidence, hoping to preserve our lives against the predictions of spiders. At night, we stand in the doorway and listen to seeds splitting the earth. Blinking, this is a poem that I have to really resist the urge not to do a, a Morton Marcus imitation because um, I, I can hear his voice in my head as I'm reading this. Blinking. And I'm going to resist, by the way. <laughs> You've got to love life so much that you don't want to miss a moment of it and pay such close attention to whatever you're doing that each time you blink, you can hear your eyelashes applauding what you've just seen. In each eye, there are more than 80 eyelashes, 40 above and 40 below, like 40 pairs of arms working, 80 pairs in both eyes, a whole audience clapping so loud you can hardly bear to listen. 160 hands batter each other every time you blink. Bravo, they call. Encore, encore. Paralyzed in a hospital bed or watching the cold rain from under a bridge. Remember this. Morton Marcus. So for the last eight years, a national poetry competition has been held to honor Morton Marcus, and it's a great pleasure to welcome my dear friend, Jory Post, who will introduce this year's winning poet. Before I do, I'd like to give a special shout out to Jory, who is not only an accomplished writer, and I encourage you to pick up a copy of his new book of poems, The Extra Year, but also a letterpress printer, a book artist, and the power behind many literary and educational endeavors, including Santa Cruz Writes and Frenzy. Jory is a longtime advocate of the arts in our community, and we are lucky to count him as our own. Jory Post. Thanks, Gary. As Gary said, this is the eighth year of the Morton Marcus Poetry Prize, a contest organized by Santa Cruz Writes and the Frenzy Online Literary Magazine, sponsored every year by, once again, George Al Jr. and Al Family Properties. The ongoing support by George and his family in Santa Cruz County is just beyond belief sometimes how much he does for the arts and education and literary events. Um, eight years, so there have been seven winners, and I think three of them are here. David Sullivan. Uh, Danusha Lamaris. And Veronica Kornberg. If 
there are any others, yell at me, but I don't think so. Who said that? No? Okay. Um, I'd also like to extend a huge thank you to Patrice Vecchioni, who judged this year's entries. Um, she's home ill tonight, but sends her best wishes. She selected a poem called Limoncini, written by Paola Bruni as the first place winner. In addition to hearing Paola read her poem tonight, you can also read it again on frenzy.org. Let me tell you a little about Paola. Her poetry has been published in the Comstock Review, the Catamaran Literary Reader, Mudfish, Porter Gulch Review, and will appear in an upcoming issue of the Massachusetts Review. She's the 2017 winner of the Muriel Craft Bailey Poetry Contest, judged by Ellen Bass. Pal is also co-author of the nonfiction book, Let God Love You Up, published by the Maria Press, 2015. One other little rumor I've heard about Paula is that she's writing a novel called Swimming to Capri. And um, I hear that it's probably going to be up for the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Paula Bruni, winner. So there, I outed your novel. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Wow. This is very exciting. So at the risk of being a little redundant, I am going to also offer my thanks to the Morgan, Morton Marcus Reading Committee, Frenzy, Santa Cruz Writes, and all of the uh, committee that helped make this possible. Of course, the sponsors as well. And a special thank you to Patrice, who unfortunately isn't here. Um, just a, a moment about this poem. My parents were Italian immigrants, and I'm a first-generation American. But I went to school not speaking English, and um, a teacher recently reminded me that those sounds are still in my body. And so this is actually the first poem I wrote incorporating my Italian language. So I'll read it for you. Limoncini. The small craters of the sun-tipped Villa Franca lemon, bitter to the tongue. Perhaps, my grandmother would say, a propagation like the Sicilians themselves, too much salt in the air. The fruit has a pale oval neck, an inconspicuous nipple. To her, it was a stunted variety, as I feared was I. My breasts, she termed limoncini, a pair of petite sour fruits I'd inherited from my father's side. <laughs> For hers were classically primo fiore, a strain of lemon excessive in their fleshy countenance. In my adolescence, she took to pinching my nipples between her thumb and forefinger. I implored my mother to intervene, but on the subject of breasts, she spoke only to say, you didn't want my milk, my infant lips refusing to suckle. When the surgeons took my mother's left breast, I was 18 and filled with remorse. Does rejection grow invasive roots? Grandmother developed an attraction for the ample thick rind Genoa and Lisbon varieties. On special occasions, the limetta was sought, a sweet, incestuous merit marriage of the Eureka lemon and Mexican lime. She served fricassea di vitella, cotolette di maiale fritte, crostata di limone, dishes so rife with lemony hues, every meal lifted to a bright archipelago. We did not understand the lemon's complex vocabulary 
or how deeply its seeds were sown. By the time I left college, grandmother stopped referring to my breasts as limoncini. Instead, un peccato, a shame. She worried I would not mate, would not propagate. How often I thought of her through my barren, childless years. Grandmother was long gone when mother's ripe breast was trimmed away. She was left no foliage to soak up the warmth of the world, only pale pink branches that spread across her chest. Thank you. Thank you, Paula, and congratulations. It's hard to know where to begin introducing Gary Soto. We have been friends for 45 years, having met at UC Irvine, where we both received our MFAs. We even shared housing in a complex of dilapidated shacks in Laguna Beach, though as I recall, Gary's unit looked out over the ocean and mine faced a backyard fence piled with broken pots. Um, in those years, Gary was already winning prizes, publishing in the top journals, and he was polishing up the poems that would be published in his groundbreaking work, The Elements of San Joaquin, just a year after he received his degree. While the rest of us were still trying to figure out what we wanted to say and how to say it, Gary was already breaking open the literature of the Latinx experience. His powerful evocation of the San Joaquin Valley and the lives of those who work its fields and farms gave a voice to those whose voices had not yet been heard. Gary's poems validated the lives of untold legions and gave them reason to be proud of their stories and their experience. In the intervening years, Gary Soto has published more than 40 books of poetry, novels, memoirs, even an opera, for children, young adults, adults, including Baseball in April, Living Up the Street, A Summer Life, Buried Onions, and The Afterlife, among many, many more. The Elements of San Joaquin, when it first uh, came out, won the United States Award for the International Poetry Forum in 1976. And it remains a seminal work of Chicano literature. Soto has been awarded fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. And his new selected poems was a 1995 finalist for both the National Book Award and the Los Angeles Times Book Award. His books have sold over four million copies nationwide and have been translated to French, Japanese, Italian, Korean, and Spanish. And I hope if you're ever in Fresno that you'll visit the Gary Soto Literary Museum located at Fresno City College. For 20 years, I taught a poetry course for artists in the schools program here in Santa Cruz County. And uh, I went into junior high school classrooms and I always felt that Gary was my companion on that project because in every junior high school classroom from Pajaro to Scotts Valley, there were stacks of baseball in April or living up the street or some other book of Gary's. And I'm sure there are plenty of budding writers here tonight who were influenced and inspired by the work they encountered in those early years. In his book, Sudden Loss of Dignity, Gary shows off his talent for leavening great truths with wit and self-effacing humor. Ambition begins, I planted 33 tulips in honor of my teeth and swept the drive so my limp might enjoy a workout. His willingness to expose his own fo follies and embarrassments is an invitation to his readers to join him. 
he leaves no doubt that he'll never let them down. Please welcome my dear friend, Gary Soto. I feel like I'm at the Academy Awards. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I've gotten, but um, I even have flowers up here. It's very close to the image of what I think is the Nobel Prize. <laughs> I don't know. I've been writing for uh, 45 years, and I, Gary said, why don't you uh, visit a class of mine? You know, you earn a little bit more money. I said, I'm really scared of Santa Cruz, because I last time I read here was 25 years ago, and uh, I was at a, a book store. No, actually, there was, yeah, at a bookstore, and there was a big Chicano with a bigote like this, Fu Manchu kind of thing going on. And um, I was scared of him, and he was looking at me. And I said, uh, finally, there was, you know, the Q&A. And he stood up. He goes, what has been your contribution to Chicano literature? And I told him, I'm the first Mexican to write in complete sentences. You know, that kind of, uh, that kind of, so, okay, I'm just asking, that's all, you know. <laughs> you know, so the image of, uh, you know, books, you know, I saw the, you know, like a lot of my books up there for sale. You know, that table, it's no coincidence that, that it's up there and I'm here. And, um, you know, I've never seen, like, uh, people carry my books around. And I saw this young man, Randy, over here from Bakersfield, over here, was carrying, carrying my book around. And Alejandro and Mateo over here. And I kind of like that. You know, I go off to him right away, would you like me to sign that? And I go, yeah. <laughs> but the first time I ever saw someone carry my book in public uh, was about 10 years ago. And it was a little children's book. It was called uh, Marisol uh, from the American Girls series. And uh, I saw her. I was playing old man basketball. And I looked at her, I said, oh my God, someone's carrying my book. So I'll go up to the little girl and I said, uh, you know, child, I wrote that book. And she looked up at me, she was like on page 83. And she says, she, I knew in her heart she was saying, dirty old man trying to talk to me. And of course, I hurried away thinking, oh man, I'm going to get in trouble, you know, with uh, talking to a young girl. I said, I really did write that book. And I did write that book. And I wrote this one as well. It's called The Elements of San Joaquin, and I'm actually just going to read you the preface, the preface which says a lot about uh, my poetics and my beginning as a poet. As Gary said, uh, the book was written in the uh, early, mid-70s. In spring 1972, I wrote my first poem, Little League Tryouts. As I considered this pile of lines, I was momentarily astonished they had come from my pencil. I was 20, long-haired, thin as my first literary effort, and secretly hoarding this activity, poetry. Poetry in my family. My family were farm workers, warehouse people, janitors, egg candlers, and industrial potato, potato peelers. And in the case of my grandfather, security guard at the Sun Made Raisin factory. The factory was not far from where we lived, and by far, I mean two blocks away. At night, we could hear its machinery and the grinding gears of the trucks they rounded the corners of Braley and Van Ness Avenues. These sounds and sights became the sources of this young poet. As a poet, I consider the San Joaquin Valley a place of wonderment, yes, wonderment, as I had suddenly admitted my emotional attachment to my neighborhood on Braley Street, the setting of the poems in section three. I don't know how other poets harbor memory, but until I was in my mid-30s, I could conjure up the small details from childhood, from the stench of the chinaberry crushed underfoot as the death of red ants by the quick push of my thumb. Quick because the go slow risked a vicious ant bite. And so it's kind of like what, the, the, what we call wonderment. And I was waking up for the first time age 21. And in this poem here, it's called The Elements of San Joaquin. I'm just going to read you a few 
of the elements. The elements include field, wind, uh, sun, stars, harvest, fog, rain, uh, weeds, daybreak. And just to get a sense, I'm 20 years old writing like this. The wind sprays pale dirt into my mouth, the small, almost invisible scars on my hands. The pores in my throat and elbows have taken in a seed of dirt of their own. After a day in the grape fields near Berlinda, a fine silt washed by sweat has settled into the lines of my wrists and palms. Already I'm becoming the valley, a soil that sprouts nothing for any of us. A dry wind over the valley peeled mountains grain by grain to small slopes, loose dirt where red ants tunnel. The wind strokes the skulls and spines of cattle to white dust, to nothing, covers the spiked tracks of beetles, of tumbleweed, of sparrows that peck the ground for insects. Evenings when I'm in the yard weeding, the wind picks up the breath of my armpits like dust, swirls it miles away, and drops it on the ear of a stray dog, and I take on another life, a second wind. When you got up this morning, the sun blazed an hour in the sky. A lizard hid under the curled leaves of manzanita and winked its dark lids. Later, the sky grayed and the cold wind you breathed was moving under your skin and already far from the small hives of your lungs. I don't know how I got to these poems at age 20, but here I am writing what I thought was serious work. I didn't know what I was going to do with it. But eventually, it became a book. Eventually, I gave it to my grandmother. Eventually, she went out and bought a picture frame. She was from Mexico. She could neither read nor write in Spanish nor English. But she knew this book called The Elements of San Joaquin was important. So she put it on a, in a picture frame and put it on her television, which was the highest honor in her house. <laughs> that was an honor. And as Gary had mentioned, I've you know, received a few honors, but probably the, the finest honor ever was in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, when I was at an educational conference and I was sitting behind a, a table, not unlike this one over here, a table where no one was visiting me to sign books. I was just sitting there looking around. Uh, and this woman came up, and I liked her right away because on her breast, she had an Obama pen, and she had a, behind her, she was pulling a cart of of books. And lo and behold, they were my books. And she put them on uh, the table. And I, I write children's literature, so there's like, children, you know, Too Many Tamales, Chato's Kitchen, a lot of books. And she, in her southern voice, said, you know, you're my favorite writer of all time. I go, really? I said, really? Yeah, in fact, you mean so much to me that I named my dog after you. <laughs> so I asked her, well, What's the dog's name? She goes, well, Soto. And I go, well, what kind of dog is it? Well, a chihuahua, of course. <laughs> you know, as a writer, you know, I'm like, what's wrong with a you know, German Shepherd or a pit bull? But no, I, be, I, have, to be a, I have to be a chihuahua. <laughs> In this little book of mine called Meatballs for the People, uh, Proverbs to Chew On, I finally got wise. And uh, I've, these, you know, I'm not going to compare it to the Proverbs in the Bible, and the Proverbs is my book, but it's kind of close, actually. And <laughs> At the heart of, of a proverb is poetry, and poetry has been my art since I was long a long-haired young man in the early 1970s. My hair, as you can see, is in rapid retreat, as a friend keeps reminding me. Uh, a sound proverb is the epitome of wisdom, as in haste makes waste, or a penny saved is a penny, penny earned. A proverb stops us for a moment, true we think, very true. Pennies add up to dollars. Shoelaces tied in a hurry soon demand our attention. Proverbs then might be cautionary tales without the tales, just thoughtful transcripts of the briefest kind. Proverbs, without doubt, are the wor words of scholars and peasants. They share a literary landscape without envy. No awards crown the authors. No royalties are dispersed. They don't take 
effort to read. They are not riddles or cagey games, but do require an awe moment. All proverbs in all languages over the centuries are quips that speak of our human nature. They are tonics against flabby language. They offer an immediate response. And I'm thinking right now of a bumper sticker I came upon that read, Dear Lord, let me be the person my dog thinks I am. <laughs> that chihuahua dog. And so I'm going to read you some uh, Proverbs. And uh, I really had a lot of fun. I wrote a thousand of them and 500 ended up in the book. A backbone is more useful than a wishbone. A flower grows even among litter. Weekly deductions from your paycheck, government thievery. Friends cash out when you're broke. Roughly cut bread, rough hand behind the knife. The middle son takes the beating. Loan him 20, next week it's 50. The poetry slam starts at 7 p.m., ends when you turn 25. <laughs> the child refused to grow up, yet died at 90. Pushing a stroller at 15, sentenced without parole. A good joke, but not over and over. If you go to the store, you'll buy. The hot dog looks the same on either end. A leaf blower, your wife, when she found out about the other woman. The DV, DMV, Hell without the fire. <laughs> At a hole in the wall, take out flies cut in line. Want to marry an older divorced guy? Spend a day with his three children. The, gangsters steal, the gangster steals flowers for his best friend's funeral. And one more. The preacher's son is right, righteously in jail. And so, I write Proverbs as well as children's literature and two poems that reflect some of the things I've done in the form of poetry for younger readers. This poem is called Tortillas Like Africa, and it's about making your first tortillas, which is, you know, tort tortilla making is a real art. It's not simply something you buy at Safeway. When my primo Isaac and me squeezed dough over a mixing bowl, when we dusted the cutting board with flour, when we spanked and palmed our balls of dough, when we said, here it goes, and began rolling that tortillas, we giggled because ours came out not round like mama's, but in the shape of faraway lands. Here was Africa. Here was Colombia and Greenland. Here was Italy, the boot country. And here was Mexico, our homeland to the south. Here was Chile, thin as a tie. Here was France, square as a hat. Here was Australia with patches of jumping kangaroos. We rolled out our tortillas on the board and laughed when we threw them on the comal. These tortillas, they were not round as the pocked moon, but the twist and stretch of the earth taking shape. So we made our first batch of tortillas laughing. So we wrapped them in a dish towel. So we buttered and rolled two each and sat on the front porch. Butter ran down our arms and our faces shone. I asked my primo Isaac, how's yours? He cleared his throat and opened up his tortilla. He said, bueno, Greenland tastes like Mexico. <laughs> Another poem for younger readers. This one's called My Teacher in the Market. And going to, I used to do a lot of school visits um, in the San Joaquin Valley particularly. And uh, small communities, you know, where, you know, 99% uh, are raza, Mexican, and uh, communities of 1,000, 2,000. And so when they see their teacher at a the supermarket, they, the kids get really excited. 
Oh, man, there's Mrs. Lopez, man. She's buying a keg for the weekend. And, uh, and after a week of school teaching, man, they probably need two kegs. But this is a poem about that. My teacher in the market. Who would suppose on a Saturday my teacher would balance tomatoes in her hands and sniff them right under my nose? I'm Maria, the girl with a Band-Aid on each knee, pink scars the shape of check marks on homework. I'm hiding by the bags of potatoes, tiptoeing and curious. I've never seen my teacher in jeans and a t-shirt and tennis with a hole with the little toe rubs. She bags the tomatoes in a pinch of ch uh, chiles. She presses a thumb gently into ripe avocados, three for a dollar because they're black, black, but pretty black. I wave to my teacher and then duck, giggling. I look up. She lifts a watermelon into her arms, melon with his army of seeds to spit across the sidewalk. I can't imagine her doing that. My teacher, my teacher. She wastes nectarines and plums, peaches with her belly of itchy fur. I wave again and duck. It's funny seeing my teacher drop a grape into her mouth, the same mouth that says four times six is 36. I mean, 24. <laughs> she lowers the bunch of grapes into a plastic bag. Then she turns toward the, toward the potatoes and finds me peeking through. When she says, oh, it's Maria, my little potato eyes. I blush and squint my eyes shut. When I open them, she's gone, her shopping cart now swinging down the aisle of cereals, leaving me, Maria, little potato eyes. Now, I, you know, I have kind of a love-hate relationship with teachers, man. I, you know, I, man, I'll tell you right now, I'm, I didn't do well in school. Um, first grade, my teacher hated me. And, um, and I'll just give you one. I, 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 love, I love my teacher, but she didn't like me. I must have done something one day because she... She pulled me to the front of the class. She was like, this is like 1957, so corporal punishment was okay. So she was shaking me, and I was like, you know, moving my little body around. And she asked the class, she asked the class, how many want Gary to go to the principal's office? <laughs> and everyone's hand went up. <laughs> Even my best friend, Daryl, said, oh, no, nah, Daryl. <laughs> no, nah, it's kind of sad, you know, so I graduated from high school with 1.6 GPA, and uh, that's where I ended up at City College, which was, you know, ended up kind of saving me in a way. So it was kind of a rough time, I think, academically, uh, but not so much in this poem here, which is called Oranges, and uh, Oranges is about a young man, me age 13, uh, wanting to go out with a girl, and I do in this poem. The first time I went out with a girl, I was 13 years old, cold, and weighted down with two oranges in my jacket. December, frost, cracking beneath my steps, my breath before me, then gone as I walked toward her house, the one whose porch light burned yellow, night and day, in any weather. A dog barked at me until she came out pulling at her gloves, her face bright with makeup. I smiled, touched her shoulder, and led her across the street, across a used car lot and a line of newly planted trees until we were standing before a drugstore. We entered the drugstore, the tiny, tiny bell bringing a sales lady down a narrow aisle of goods. I turned to the candies, cheered like bleachers, and asked what she wanted. Light in her eyes, a smile, starting at the corners of her mouth. I fingered a nickel in my pocket, and when she lifted a chocolate candy bar that cost a dime, I didn't say anything. I took the nickel from my pocket, then an orange, and set them quietly on the counter. When I looked up, the sales lady's eyes met mine and held them, knowing very well what it was all about. Love, I mean. Outside the drugstore, a few cars hissing past, fog, hanging like old coats, coats between the trees. I took my girl's hand in mine for two blocks, then released it to let her wrap a chocolate. I peeled my orange that was so bright against the gray of December that from some distance, someone might have thought I was making a fire in my hands. So 
So I was already the Julia Iglesias of poetry back then. Uh, <laughs> um, the girls were liking me. And uh, again, I graduated from high school with 1.6 GPA, and it's our 50th class reunion this, this May. I'm not going to go. <laughs> no way. I don't want anyone to bring up my GPA and so on. But I did a presentation, oh, well, maybe 15 years in, uh, ago in Fresno at a small uh, library. And, uh, you know, I was doing my little thing with the kids, my dog and pony show. And there was, I asked the kids, because you have to ask, them, ask me a question. So I, kids, you, got, you have a question? And the little kid, little squirrely boy in the front row, he asked me, he said, yeah, I have a question. And he goes, yeah, what's your question, young man? He goes, well, did you used to go out with my mom? <laughs> And I looked at the little dude. He looked kind of familiar, you know. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not going. Uh, I've, uh, you know, written uh, thematically, uh, you know, different areas, uh, different genres, um, picture books, novels, memoir, plays. Uh, Gary mentioned an opera. I did an opera. And... Uh, I become Shakespeare in this, this collection, and it's certainly different from anything I've ever done before. I don't know why I started this book, except the introduction says something about how the book started. The book is called You Kiss by the Book, which is a line of Shakespeare. And in this collection, I take a line of the bard, meaning Bill Shakespeare, me, and then I build upon that, that first line. The best thing about this book is that it's cataloged Shakespeare and Soto. And I said, well, I may as well go high, you know, if I'm going to have a, <laughs> another influence. Uh, so I say in this introduction, what poet doesn't borrow a cup of influence? What poet doesn't sprinkle his or her poetry with the sweet flavor of another's work? I kicked around these thoughts in a used bookstore as I read a paperback edition of Shakespeare's sonnets. I hadn't read, hadn't read Shakespeare in years, but here I was, midway through a mundane week, with my reading glasses midway down my nose, when a poem touched me in a way no other poem had touched me in a long, long time. It was Sonnet 18, beautifully tailored, rhythmical in its cadence, true as the moon is true, and instructive in our temporary nature. The lines were these. So long as men can breathe or eyes see, so long lives this, and this life, this give life to thee. Okay, so I read that and I thought, you know, I have an idea here. I'm going to risk, risk it and become Shakespeare. And someone had never read uh, Romeo and Juliet and they asked me, hey, Mr. Soto, how did it turn out with Romeo and Juliet? I said, not so good, you know, <laughs> they died. So the first one is uh, Romeo and Juliet's line, and uh, I, I may reference the line and the, uh, the source and all that. The first line is Shakespeare, the rest is mine. The more I give to thee, the more I have. As you are my wife, I give thee the thatch on the roof. You give to me the pots, piping soup. The sheep I give thee, the cow's milk and the rooster's crow, the rows of beans you offer, the lettuce and the turnip, the carrot long as a dog's tail, the potato on a fork, all the harvesting of love. To thee I give apples and my love all summer. In spring you give me the rose of a child. This line is from all's well that ends well, the first line. Get thee a good husband and use him as he uses thee. To his soup add meat, carrots, and the tears of an onion. Remember to keep the teapot on the stove, the biscuit a sweet thing to crumble, and butter to make him melt. By candlelight or by moonlight, he loves you in all places. Night is best with a window partly opened for the gossipy neighborhood to hear love's thrashing. When he's out of his boots, your husband is not tall. His hat is but a basket of all his dreams, and his loveliest dream is of you. Marriage is such a sweet porridge. In bed, 
you come first and ask for seconds. Nasty Gary there. Okay. <laughs> now, I went to graduate school with poets, and they were, you know, prone to drink. And uh, after a while, they had a difficult time forming words. So this is a poem dedicated to every student who went through a graduate program in creative writing. Drunk and speak parrot? Speak hog and cow and the fourth language, donkey? Drink makes us sing and brag. And if the corks fly, if the brew foams and tankers, then we revel and recount our journeys, all fanciful tales. We recount lasses who loved us in spite of our stink and drab cloaks. We recount bears who chase us into trees so tall we can see the Isle of Wight from, from such heights and probable babble that makes us slap our knees. Drunk, we speak parrot, hog and cow, dog and rooster, and toward morning braid the language of donkeys. Two more Shakespearean-themed poems. The naked truth of it is, I have no shirt. Presently, my shoes squeak from holes, and my breeches are held up by a clothespin. My belt, I bartered for a pie. And let us not speak of the hat that flew like straw, the frock lost in a roll of dice, or my father's ring hawked for lodging. My teeth went, then my hair, my eyes leaked from their own piping sorrow. Though pl plentiful air is all around, I'm winded when I step three paces. O oh, poverty, I came into this life naked, and naked I'll go. And one final Shakespearean poem here, and it comes from uh, Henry IV here. Can honor set to a leg? No. Or an arm? No. Can honor straighten a humpback grocer, iron out a plowman's finger hurt by age? Can honor dispatch the purplish gout? Can honor make the blind see? Can honor retie the knot of a maiden head? Distrust the fellow who speaks of honor, for surely he is a politician who speaks from both sides of his, of his mouth and once elected from the pucker of his arse. Okay. I think we have some of them in, in Washington, D.C. All right, here now. I am going to read a poem about... Now, I have to go back to the 1950s, and this poem is, is about um, not, not behaving, not listening. It's called Apple. And uh, back in the 50s, we had little apple pies that came out in little, um, little plastic, uh, wax paper. It wasn't sealed like we have now for uh, you know, uh, quality control, but they were open. So just picture me, five years old, my mother gives me some money to go down to this store. I didn't catch on right away that meanness was part of our family. I kept going where people told me to go. One day my mother sent me to Charlie's Market for an apple pie, the kind in which one peeks from a sleeve of wax paper. I gave Charlie the 15 cents. I started home, staring at the end of the apple pie, a little snout of sugary crust. I wanted very badly to take one bite. I walked slowly thinking, just one bite. Mother would say, you had yours without asking, but next time wait. She wouldn't be too mad. I worried about the apple pie, walked slowly around the block the long way, and when I couldn't stand it anymore, I took a bite. A sugary flake fell from my mouth. It was sweet. I took a second bite and three lines worried my brow. I put the pie, uh, I took the pie out of the paper wrapper and turned it the other way so the eaten side didn't show. <laughs> but I kept walking around the block, a kid lost in a neighborly orbit and staring at the pie. Again, I couldn't stand it. My mouth opened when my hand forced the pie to my face. Now both sides are ruined, chunks gone out. How could I say, Mom, I don't know how it got that way. <laughs> I hid in a 
vacant lot behind a stack of greenish boards, companion to the scurry of red ants at my feet, I don't remember ever getting back home. <laughs> and it's just kind of like, that was before first grade when my teacher hated my guts. <laughs> A poem called TV in Black and White, a reference to Donna Reed, uh, a television program that's in which sort of we're supposed to emulate the Donna Reed family and the Ozzie Nelson family at the same period. And no one that I knew lived like that, but we're somehow so, so, supposed to emulate this middle, upper, middle class family. So just a, as a reference, it's called TV in Black and White. In the mid-60s, we were sentenced to watch the rich on TV, Donna Reed high-heeled in the kitchen, Ozzie Nelson bending in his eighth season over golf. While he swung, we hoed fields flagged with cotton because we understood a sock should have a foot, a cuff, a wrist, wrist, and a cup was always smaller than your thirst. When Donna turned the steaks and onions, we turned grape trays in a vineyard that we worked like an abagus a row at a time. And today the world still plots and ravels with piano lessons for this child, braces for that one, gin in the afternoon, ice from the bucket. But, but if the electricity should fail in this town, a storefront might be smashed, sacks may find hands, a whistle point the way. And if someone steps out with a black and white TV, it's because we love you, Donna, we miss you. Ozzy. I got a mean poem, man. God, let me, uh... Okay, I'll stop with meanness right now, and I'm going to go to something really, really uh, light. And that has to do with my grandmother. Now, there's, uh, you know, there's ways of looking at uh, abuelitas or grandmothers from my generation, and I have my own vision of what she's like. She was about four foot eleven, very tough, and uh, it's coming up any second. It's called Behind Grandma's House. And Brill Cream, for those who don't know, is a hair gel from the uh, 50s and 60s, and it caused my generation to go, grow bald. <laughs> At 10, I wanted fame. I had a Comb and two Coke bottles, a tube of Brill Cream. I borrowed a dog, one with mismatched eyes and a happy tongue, and wanted to prove I was tough in the alley, kicking over trash cans, a dull chime of tuna cans falling. I hurled light bulbs like grenades, and men teachers held their heads, fingers of blood lengthening on the ground. I flicked rocks at cats, their goofy faces spurred with foxtails. I kicked fences. I shooed pigeons. I broke a branch from a flowering peach and frightened ants with a stream of spit. I said, chale, in your face, no way daddy o to an imaginary priest until my grandmother, mi abuelita, came into the alley, her apron flapping in the breeze, her hair must, and said, let me help you, and punched me between the eyes. Grandmotherly love, Fresno. Uh, Gary had mentioned a book, uh, Sudden Loss of Dignity. And um, I think that as you get older, you realize, God, you're kind of old. I remember thinking uh, when I was 57, I, I woke up in bed. I go, I thought I was 47. I'm 57. And it's kind of like, oh, wow, this is, this is kind of frightening. And um, 57 is looking pretty good now, but... Uh, those years are gone. So this is a, a sudden loss of dignity is when you realize that uh, maybe you're on a bus and someone says, would you like to take my seat? And, uh, and your answer is, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I can sure to sit down right now. Uh, this is a poem called On Schedule. And poets of my generation or just people in my generation were on schedule for something much, much Friday than uh, maybe a parking ticket or something. On schedule. To be born in 1899 as Borges was, Borges the writer, or born in 1878 as Jack London was, 
or brought into the light in 1847 as Thomas and Edison was. All great men now with rocks in their chests, the sea far away. I'm part hourglass, haven't eaten at least a minute of childhood sand. I'm an occasional sundial, having for six decades thrown out a shadow. The God on the Aztec calendar has stuck its tongue out at me, and I tap my watch to keep it plugging along. The river flows, and as such, it's a clock, as are the clouds with their brisk oars, the petals of the tulip with its own timetable. It will attract the bee, and the bee will do its work. And look, the moon is one day, day faint, the other day milky white. And the candle I see sputters, wax down one side. To be born a Medici, gold coins under the mattress, or a drunken Pope Clement with brats at his feet, or Genghis Khan, an enemy's beard crocheted into slippers, all great men, all builders and doers, now with boulders holding down their bones. The sea far away, the herds of us humans still clashing above. To be born in 1952, me, April, if scholars care to know, I'm no doer, no builder, no statesman with his hand over his heart reciting the party line. True, I've fathered, I've built a house with three windows, each with the people I love best. But at least no brick has been purchased in my honor and plugged into a wall of a theater. I'm no other, no other than an old guy tying his shoelaces at the end of the corner, a cricket of pain in his knees. I'll take my calendars to the sea and toss them leaf by leaf into the rough waves. I'll fill my hourglass a second here, a minute there, and as the sand whips up, and I taste the salt of every living thing. Now, uh, I'm not uh, cooperative. Um, Gary Young knows that. Chris Buckley, a very dear friend, he knows that. Uh, I haven't read uh, Dan Poetry Reading in years and years. And so I was on a, I don't know, radio show, and they asked me what my novel was about, and this was my answer. And it's dedicated to Martin Amos, who shares the same kind of uh, behavior where I'm not, you know, I just don't act right. <laughs> what is your novel about, Mr. Soto? The nightly host asked in a small room strangled with electrical cords. I've been living on yawns for the last 15 minutes, yawns in the breeze from the fan fanning my novel. I answered, it's 125,000 words, 300 pages, one death, a cornfield gone wild. Tomorrow I'm at Barnes and Nobles in Wichita. They, they showed me the door. Out the door, I clutch my book and realize it's a long way to Kansas. No, it's just right there. A tornado spun its tail in the distance, and I was, it was headed my way. Voices inside howling the wrong answers. For those who have uh, odd dreams, I have odd dreams. So this is a poem called Dr. Freud, please. It was a short night down a long hallway where at the end of the hallway, a polar bear was drinking from the toilet. The bear looked up, beads on his chin. He stood tall as a white Christmas tree and gave me, well, a bear hug. Oh, Jesus, oh, Buddha, my wife says. Her newspaper slapped open to the business section. Our mutual funds are down, will remain down. Why can't you have nice dreams, she asks and turns the page. I dress first, putting on my socks, then my shirt. I need good habits. I ate a bowl of cereal sugared by half a banana. I trace my palm. The lifeline, lifeline is far too deep for what I have to do. I look out the window, no bear, just rain like a long silver sleeve running down the streets. And look, a neighbor, a plastic bag gloved over his hand, picking up a steaming dog turd. Is this it? We end our days following a chihuahua on a short leash? That chihuahua is not me, by the way. <laughs> Dr. Freud, where is the bear in real life? Where is the comb whittled from a whale's tooth? 
the cheetah that runs daylight, runs daylight ragged, the cobra with a snap judgment. Where is the blood spilled in honor of the women we love or sort of like? My armada, my annex territory, a bar of unsinkable soap in a steamy bath is no answer. Dr. Freud, consider my cat, a declawed boy who spends his day licking his paws. True fangs gleam in his skull. I possess fangs in my own mouth, but our meals are bloodless, almost vegan. I drink from a cup. He drinks from a bowl. What's the difference? And note this, dear doctor, when we sleep, our legs twitch, and not from the hunt, but from trying to run away. I, mean, I wish I mean, the poem was really about wanting to have something uh, exciting in your life. And it's certainly not in this poem called An Odd Moment. Uh, kids, are, you know, I went to an Apple High School, and one of the kids asked me, are you a celebrity? <laughs> I said, I don't know. Why don't you follow me to my car? And so he followed me to my car, and it was a Buick Century. He goes, no, you're not. <laughs> So it's about, you know, trying to, like, uh, entertain the, the kids. And their, their reaction is something like this. It's called An Odd Moment. I was reading from an old book of poetry when the ninth grade class of Catholic girls began to yawn, each of them a little bird wanting to be fed, something other than sweet John Keats. To save the moment, I asked, ladies, what's your favorite dessert? None raised a hand. Some moaned and reached into the sleeves for cell phones. How long would this fossil go on? <laughs> Failing to reach the young, I left the school and sat in a park where I befriended, befriended a small dog with a mighty hose between his legs. How in the hell was he born with that? I laughed. I petted his scruff and read his dog tags. Stud. <laughs> I live... <laughs> I live briefly in his eyes, in the wag of his tail. For mineral intake, I guess he began to lick my hand. Me, an old salt. <laughs> Me. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like poetry very much right now. I want you to ask me a question. <laughs> I mean, this dog is... Uh, Ask me a question about writing books, poetry. I'd like to answer something before I go on. <laughs> Mr. Buckley, he's a friend of mine from graduate school. A question. What are the metaphysical implications of sun-made raisin? Okay, uh, what are the metaphysical, metaphysical ramifications of uh, sun-made raisin? Uh, well, actually... I have an answer for that. It has to, it involves that dog studs. No, no, no. No, actually, we, we lived two blocks away from Sun Made Raisin, which is a factory that uh, box raisins, in which our, our family members were involved uh, in some capacity there. Uh, my grandfather, for instance, was a security guard. He liked to, pers he, had a, he had like a black thing, black, you know, khakis, black shirt with a little uh, star on his on his chest, and he, you know, he said, I'm the police, man. So he was like the police of the raisins. <laughs> so, but living within the, uh, the sighting of a sun-made raisin and the noise of the raisins, the smell of the raisins, it becomes part of your, uh, your childhood. And you don't have to stay there too long to realize that this is, uh, this is going to be something that you'll remember for a very long time. And the truck's always sort of like, going around the corner to pick up more raisins to take it somewhere uh, far away. Uh, that is my answer. One more question. I'm going to end my presentation. But I'm going to mention also I met um, Morton twice. Uh, one, once at uh, Foothill Community College. He was uh, leading a poetry workshop. We were passing each other. And I looked down and he was carrying um, uh, student work. And the student work was well annotated with comments from him. Very smart remarks, I assumed. I couldn't read, you know, closely. 
And I was carrying student work as well. And on my work, my batch of papers, I just had a little note to myself that said, lunch is at 12.30. <laughs> so Morton was well prepared. He was you know, a meaningful uh, teacher, a thoughtful teacher, and um, not me. And the second time I met him was at his home, and he was, we we're talking about basketball. I was still playing basketball at the time. And, you know, you know not, uh, you know, recreational bas basketball at a court. And he goes, yeah, I, I like basketball, but I often tell myself when I'm on the court, I tell my body to go there, please, really quickly, but it doesn't behave. <laughs> so I remember those two things about Morton, and, of course, his work and uh, uh, there was a, he was a very jolly, I don't know whether the jolly is the right word, but um, um, had a lot of laughter in him and um, a lot of love. And I want to use, lose, use the word here. He was a bit of a, an old word, Weisenheimer. You know, he's full of jokes and uh, was a very beautiful man. One more question. It's a pleasure to be part of this series, a longstanding uh, 10 years. And it's been a while since I've been here in Santa Cruz to give a presentation. And it's, a, it's an honor. One last question. We have actually someone, I don't know if it's true or not, she came from um, Panama. Is that right, Alejandra? Is that right? Where are you, Alejandra? Or did you, did you just, there she is. Is it, is it, is it true? Yes. She, and people, you were complaining about coming across, you know, the Santa Cruz uh, one with all the traffic, but... One last question, and then I'll be done. Again, it's a pleasure to be with you this beautiful evening. I can't see anyone out there, so I will assume it's over. Thank you very much. <laughs>